Howdy and welcome to this bonus edition of the Upland Nation. I'm just going to call them bonus editions because um, we may cover a little bit of uh, a variety of subjects. But uh, this first one, I'm first in a series of awesome Upland road trips. Uh, so maybe we'll call it the road trip version. It's, um, it's about, uh, well, a whole bunch of places I like to go. Uh, was asked recently to put together a list of my top five favorite bird hunting states and uh, thought that would be a fun way to start this off. Not all five. I want to give you a little bit of information that will actually be usable to you. So we're going to go one state at a time. And uh, take a moment. Yeah, take a moment and uh, think about that. Uh, what is your favorite state? What do you think uh, the top five states mine will be? We'll get to that in just a moment. Just a reminder, quickly, the road trip edition of the bonus episode of Upland Nation is brought to you by Sage and Breaker, Purina Pro Plan Sport, ESPAmerica.com, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Chokes, MidwayUSA.com, LandTrust.com, Pointer Shotguns, and High Viz Shooting Systems. Yeah, I know it was hard. Uh, if you have kids, you've probably been asked who's your favorite kid. I don't have to worry about that. I've often been asked who's my favorite dog, and I, I can't answer that. There's so many great ones, my own and other people's as well. But but if you had to narrow it down, here's the first in my top five. In no particular order, can you guess? Montana. I'll tell you why in just a minute, but the goal here is to give you just enough information to make your own decisions, pick your own destinations within a place that I've been to, boots on the ground, that I think is worth taking a look at. If you're wor you know, working hard at finding a new place to go, trying to plan your big trip of the year, or uh, scratching some things off your bucket list, uh, Montana ought to be right up there. Primarily for the prairie birds. Yes, I know, and we've had Tim Linehan on the show a few times. Tim guides forest grouse, of all things, in Montana. But we're going to talk about prairie birds because that's been my kind of my passion. And uh, Montana is a great place to pursue it. So let me just tell you a few stories. Maybe uh, relate something that you can relate to yourself. And see if that doesn't help you um, maybe the next time you're looking for a new destination. Yeah, there's a lot going for Montana, including probably the most innovative walk-in program I've ever found. And I've hunted a lot of states. Most of them have some sort of a program. The nice thing about Montana's is landowners are only compensated when they have people who use their place. Think about it. Supply, demand, crappy habitat means a crappy payday for the landowner. Kind of capitalism at work. And it works. I'm not going to say that I haven't walked some dusty, dry, grazed-over pastures or uh, covered a lot of ground that uh, looked good but didn't have any birds in it. But for the most part, if you do your homework then you'll probably have a better chance in this walk-in program, which they call Block Management Access, uh, BMA, or Block Management for short. Anyway, if you do your homework, there's a better chance that you'll find what you're looking for in Montana than a lot of other states. You know, a lot of other states, as you probably know, wherever they get their money, the, the uh, conservation or the wildlife agency, sends a guy out, he looks at the ground and decides, yeah, I'll pay you um, 50 bucks an acre for the season. Uh, the problem is what happens to that acreage after the guy signs off on the contract uh, is anybody's guess. It could get grazed, could get burnt, whatever it is. Um, there's no incentive for the landowner to do anything to keep it in bird hunting shape. Well, uh, Montana's is a little bit different in that regard. Again, like I said, sort of capitalism uh, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, if it's not good, nobody's going to go. The poor guy's not going to get paid. 
Um, there's a lot of ground in Montana. There's a lot of ground in all of my top five states. So come back often because I'll be touching on all five of them over the next few weeks in the bonus episodes that we're, we're starting out this new bonus program with. Um, vast prairies for sharp tails, boggy swales for pheasants. Yeah, and I mentioned the uh, forest birds as well. In fact, I just had a friend who I've hunted with a lot of times. Thank you, Mark, for hosting me on so many trips. Um, he's headed for Montana to tick spruce grouse off of his bucket list. That's where he's decided to go. And this guy knows his stuff. That's where he's going for his forest grouse. Uh, anyway, beyond the forest, more uh, prairie birds, huns, sage grouse. There's so much ground out there, not even a resident could hunt it all in a lifetime. Now, like I said, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. But most of the time, if you research carefully, locate in the right place, you at least have a good chance that you and your good dog are going to see birds. Whether you hit them or not, well, (laughs) don't look at me. I'm not the guy. I'm just grateful when I get within gun range. Now, that's just the private land open to public hunting, block management access. Montana, like a lot of western states, is full of publicly owned land. Yeah, we own it. We pay a bunch of bureaucrats to administer it. Luckily, most of the time, they let us cut our dogs loose and walk around on it. A lot of Forest Service ground in the western part of Montana. A lot of Bureau of Land Management land in the central and eastern part of the state. And that's before we mix in all those other kind of less obvious federal agencies from the Bureau of Reclamation to the Corps of Engineers. And then state and even county ground. A lot of state school land, for example. You could spend an entire hunting career just walking on public ground. There is some incredible public land hunting in Montana. Uh, Some of these towns that I'm going to mention are literally surrounded by public access and publicly owned land from block management ground that holds uh, pheasants and sharpies near uh, Plentywood in the northeast corner. Lewistown, smack dab in the middle of the state, one of my favorites. It's got pheasants, sharpies, a few huns, and then I've actually killed a sage grouse or two in that general vicinity. Big Timber is my go-to place for sharp-tailed grouse. Great Falls and Conrad, of all places, just north of Great Falls, I think that is, um, sharpies and pheasants. Had a great First time I ever went to Conrad was uh, for a pheasant hunt hosted by a friend of mine. He said, come on up. And I said, I've never been to Montana, so uh, I went. Had a great time. (laughs) One of the best looking Little League fields in the country was in Conrad, Montana, the last time I was out there. In fact, I was driving by doing some scouting, and one poor schlub was was there um, mowing the whole field by himself with it, you know, just a walk behind uh, uh, lawnmower. I felt so sorry for the guy, and having built four or five different Little League fields over the years, I... I pulled over and helped him bag grass for a couple hours. <laughs> oh, my. It was worth it. Brought back a lot of great memories. Another great uh, venture, if you want to call it that, is the High Line. That's, uh, it used to be a ra- well, it's still a railroad, but it's also U.S. Highway 2. goes from uh, you know, goes across the northern end of the state. The best hunting on the High Line is from Glasgow east to Plentywood. Lots of access, lots of prairie, a little bit of everything else. So if you're looking for a place to go, those are some of the places where I would start. I'm not going to give you the latitude and the longitude, but I'm going to give you some good starting points that have paid off for me. That's the whole idea behind this road trip edition of our bonus Upland Nation episodes. Now, I've talked about the Block Management Access Program, and and it's, you know, there's an art to negotiating it. There's a few things you want to do, and that's one reason I'm going to bring them up now. They have great data 
incredible online maps, and also hard copy booklets. So you want to get the booklets for the region you're going to. And there's, oh, I don't know, six or seven regions in the state of Montana. So find your spots, figure out what region they're in, go on the de department website, request the hard copies of the maps. They'll be published in late summer. And then they're available digitally and um, and uh, on your app as well. Uh, <clears throat> maps on, on, you know, your phone. They do update a lot of that stuff just before the season starts, so keep checking in as you're planning. But do plan early. There are some of these walk-in areas that require you to make a reservation with the landowner. Most of them are just basically you drive over, you find the sign-in kiosk, and you do sign in. Again, that's how the landowner gets paid. He can prove that you came over and you hunted his place. So... If, You'll find the kiosk. Even some of the online mapping apps will mark those, although sometimes they're not quite as up-to-date as they could be. So find the kiosk, sign in. Make your reservation if required. Between now and when the season starts, take long looks at that map, try and lay a plan, figure out an itinerary, a route, if you will, so that if one place doesn't work, another place will work and you're not spending half a day going to it. And make sure that in your itinerary, <clears throat> you've got a good idea of what, where and how big the federal and state and other public ground is. So there's your start on the block management access and other public access information available in Montana, one of my favorite states. I'll come back with more and even a hunting story or two in just a moment. But first, a couple, <clears throat> well, one's a public service announcement and the other one's a commercial. Commercial first for Purina Pro Plan Sport dog food designed for active, hardworking dogs, you know, like the one you're looking at right now. High protein formula, real meat is the first ingredient. That real meat brings amino acids to the table, pardon the pun. That's what nourishes muscles, especially after exercise to promote recovery. Learn more about all the formulations at ProPlanSport.com. And maybe you heard Jim Matthews on the Upland Nation a while back. Jim is a good friend of mine, a fellow writer, also the expert when it comes to Western birds. In fact, he publishes a Western birds newsletter that you might want to subscribe to. Well, Jim is uh, breaking out the jams and doing a series of public land Upland bird hunting seminars. And he says... I'm just not going to tell you what Scott tells you. I'm going to put X's on a map and give you the map. He's doing this for many parts of Southern California. So if you're interested at all, he's got a series of seminars starting June 13th at the Bass Pro Shops in Rancho Cucamonga. So if you want more information on all of these, go to OD Writer, Outdoor Writer, get it? At Verizon.net. He's got them at Pro, Bass Pro Shops, Mike Rayhoek's Shooting Enterprises down there in Southeast California, a whole bunch of them running through August. Contact Jim at odwriter at verizon.net. Welcome back to this bonus edition of the Upland Nation. We're talking road trip. One of my favorite subjects, and maybe yours too. Montana, top of the list for me. Giving you the lowdown on some of the highlights, if you want to call it that. Like so many other multi-species states, time your visit depending on the bird you're after. Yeah, there's two kind of, kind of glamour birds. The first one is ringnecks, the second one is sharpies, but there are other birds as well. But So let's start with one of those other birds. Usually I consider it a bonus, Hungarian partridge. 
Yeah, we have gone, and you've probably seen some of my TV shows where we've gone strictly for Huns. But I'll tell you, you got to scout hard and be lucky. And luckily for me, I have a friend who scouts hard. Uh, they're fun. They probably won't be in the same habitat as the other birds. If they're on your bucket list, you want to find um, relatively flat, greener ground than the other birds. Uh, these little guys will not be found in the really tall grass. The tall grass, for example, that sharp tails hang in. They like a lower growing grass. It all, almost looks like the roughs on a golf fairway. Maybe a little taller than that. And, and you, you never know where else you'll find them. I did a, a visit to Montana last year where we were in classic sharp tail country. And all we found were huns. So go figure. But generally speaking, shorter grass. The joy of huns is, number one, once they fly, they'll sit tight. They often don't fly very far, so you can follow up each flush and hunt out the singles or even some small coveys broken out of that big covey. Uh, the axiom for most of these birds is they will all, I mean, I'm sorry, for huns alone, they will fly as a covey and generally in the same direction. There, there won't be one of those popcorn flushes where they're all going at different times and in different directions. Okay. But they are a weird bird to hunt. And uh, if you read my Pointing Dog Journal article last month, you know one of the biggest challenges is that kind of the optical illusion that they pose for you because they, um, they're smaller than a chucker, bigger than a quail, uh, smaller than a sharpie. Uh, you don't know when to shoot sometimes because of that. Fun bird, love them. Can't wait to shoot some more. Maybe this season. Sharp-tailed grouse, kind of the premier western bird in a lot of ways, especially on the prairie, of course. Sweeping vistas, knobs and humps in the landscape. That's kind of classic sharpie territory. <clears throat> you know what I mean. And generally, knee-high-ish grass. One biologist described it this way. If the grass is tall enough to bend in the wind, that's where you're going to find sharp-tailed grouse. <laughs> Another one said, uh, but it can't be too thick. So if you can't see a basketball in the grass, it's too thick for sharp-tails. Those are both great descriptions of classic sharp-tail habitat. Not to say they're not anywhere else especially early in the season. If there's a bush or a thicket, you don't want to ignore that. In fact, there are many times, for a couple reasons, that birds will hang in the little pockets of shrubbery, buffalo berry, snow berry, any of that kind of stuff. It, whether it's a low-growing carpet of that stuff, I found them in there, or just a single standing bush, or even a tree. Sometimes it's for the shade, because you're hunting these birds early in the season. It's a September kind of bird. Sometimes for protection from avian predators. So if you find a stand of uh, shrubs, don't ignore it. Plan a stealthy approach. Use cover and terrain so that they can't see you, because they're usually on the high spots. And then get ready for some fun. You know, the other thing, and I, <clears throat> I, I cannot, I'll never forget this experience, <clears throat> alfalfa. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a good thing for sage grouse, but it's also a good thing for sharp-tailed grouse. And the reason isn't maybe the first thing you think of, which is they're eating it. Because eh, they might eat some. I've never found any alfalfa in a sharp tail crop. What they're eating are the grasshoppers who eat the alfalfa. We were down in the middle of nowhere. It was a hot day, and we were at the bottom of this <laughs> big, I won't even call it a draw. I'll call it a valley. Had a little tiny creek running through it. And at the bottom of this valley, you could just, there was a tinge of green. I, I took Al's word for it because I'm a little colorblind, so I might have called it brown or purple. But <clears throat> he said, let's go down there. 
And it was an old abandoned, it was like an old, old alfalfa field that had basically been droughted out, you know, decades before, but there was still some, some remnants of that alfalfa in there. And they were all <laughs> ugly, scraggly, uh, not much left of them. And I said, man, they, they are, th- this alfalfa is having a hard time. He said, yeah, but it's not what you think it is. It's all the grasshoppers eating it. Well, we thought, what the heck, let's go. At the bottom of that, near the alfalfa, was a, a long, um, well, in South Dakota, you'd call it a shelter belt. And maybe that's what we should call it in Montana, too. Shelter belt of about 10, 12-foot shrubs of one sort. I don't remember what they were. <clears throat> I don't know why they were there. Maybe there had been an old homestead. Maybe it was a shelter belt. Maybe it was just some ranch wife who wanted a little bit of green and a little bit of topology to the flatness of that place well we got on both sides of that and and it was a perfect storm it really was we had the alfalfa which means the grasshoppers we had the shade we had the protection from avian predators al on one side me on the other side we walked slowly down that row every step i thought something would come out of there Okay, one did. The biggest great horned owl I've ever met. <laughs> Almost knocked me over. But nothing. And the dogs are working pretty hard, and they're staying close, and that's a good thing in country like that, till we get to the end. And then all hell breaks loose. Two dozen grouse. Al shooting one of those old side-by-sides of his. Boom. Of course first bird down i had to kind of sprint around the the bushes blocking my shot but luckily it was the end of the row so i did that closed the gun up shot that little 28 i love so much and i dropped a bird both dogs happy both shooters happy in fact that was flick's first sharp-tailed grouse 23 weeks old Okay, so as I've said, for Sharpies, early in the season is when you want to go. Um, Otherwise, they covey up into such big groups, you'll never get close enough. Too many eyes looking for predators. Look for shade, stunted trees, even creek banks, you know, the certain time of day when they're in shade, all good bets. Go early in the season. Do your research. Do your e-scouting. Look for water holes and avoid them like the plague. They may hold blue-green algae, fatal to your dog. There's also cactus, rattlesnakes, and the biggest porcupine we've ever met. Of course, Lynn, my cameraman, had to go down into the draw and get a picture of it until it turned around and started waddling towards him. You'd think he'd know better. He's a Montanan. Oh, he did get some great footage out of it. All right, there's your sharp tails in Montana. Pheasant season, mid-October is generally when it starts. And the challenge becomes that habitat difference. There's, you know, one in ten chance you'll find a sharp tail in pheasant hab- habitat or vice versa, but most of the time they're going to be kind of separate. You can find them all in the same property. <laughs> we've done that before but for the most part they're going to like riparian areas the edges of crop fields there's some weed out there and some shelter belts you know think about south dakota if that's where you go or even iowa same kind of habitat they need more grain food most of the year especially in the fall after the bugs have gone look for some folds in the landscapes I never pass up a break going down to a piece of water. For some reason, birds hold there more frequently than any other place, at least in my experience. So walk those, put a hunter on both sides, put the dogs down in the middle. You never know what might come up there. Pheasants are fun, and and Montana has more than its share. Not, not, Not right up there with some of those other states I'll talk about soon. But 
still fun. Yeah, well, there's there's kind of oh, I didn't I didn't relate any of my sage grouse uh, experience. I, I've I've been lucky enough to go there and shoot sage grouse, and it was fun. And by the way, take care of them right, cook them correctly. They're just as good as any other game bird. Sage grouse are an early season play, just like sharpies. Check the regulations. Some places you can shoot them, some places you can't, or you can't find them. They do hang, generally, where their namesake cover is, sagebrush. But just like sharp tails, they'll spend a lot of time in and near alfalfa. They will eat it. Wouldn't you if your other choice was sagebrush? So if you can find block management access or public ground next to alfalfa fields, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Slam on the brakes, drop the tailgate, and go sage grouse hunting. They do like more, you know, in a way they, they act and hang like gigantic valley quail. They like clear ground with an overhead canopy. Sagebrush, perfect example. They can run as much as they want, but they've got their food right there. They've got lots of overhead cover. My personal experience is they like verticality. They like draws, canyons, cracks in the ground. Um, all of those things, for some reason, seem to attract sage grouse. Good luck to you. Be safe out there. If you're going early in the season especially, make sure you bring plenty of, plenty of dog power and plenty of water for that dog power. This is our first attempt here, or this is my first attempt at a special edition bonus episode. <laughs> Do more of these as we get uh, going through the summer. Uh, mainly on road trips that I've taken that I think are of value to you, but also on some other subjects. If you have any suggestions, tell me what you think of this. I'm glad to provide a bonus episode periodically. Luckily, I have the sponsors who can help me do that. If you want more information on Montana or anything else, there's another place to look. Find birdhuntingspots.com. Just about everything I do, I write about there. So if you're looking for particular information, whether it's a trip you want to take, dog training advice, hunting strategies, it's all there at findbirdhuntingspots.com. I do want to thank my sponsors for making this possible. Yeah, uh, High Vis Shooting Systems, Pointer Shotguns, LandTrust.com, MidwayUSA.com, TrueLock Chokes, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, ESPAmerica.com, Pro Plan Sport from Purina, and Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. Get in on their last bit of the Father's Day sale, SageandBreaker.com. Give me your feedback and do me a big favor. It's time for us to grow some more. Recommend the podcast to one friend. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And if you're so inclined, leave a rating or a review. I'm Scott Linden. I'm so glad you could join me. I hope I helped you take a longer look at Montana. I'll be there this season. Maybe I'll run into you. Keep me posted if you're going. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation's special bonus edition. Uh-huh.